Welcome to the Everything Everywhere Travel Writer Podcast. Join award-winning freelance journalist Joan Mianmetsui. Each week, you'll hear guests from all walks of life share their travel stories, tips, and advice on a variety of travel-related topics. Thanks for spending time with us today, and now it's time to dive into our interview. You are going to absolutely love my show today. Whether you are a fly fishing fanatic like my guest, or you want to learn more travel tips, you won't want to miss this show. My guest is Tom Rosenbauer, who is well known in the fly fishing world. He's an expert fly angler, instructor, author, and inventor, and he's also been an important part of the Orvis fly fishing family for more than four decades. He's here to talk to us about a pivotal trip he took. Please welcome Tom Rosenbauer. My first question is, what led you to fly fishing? I mean, what was it that attracted you to the sport of fly fishing? Well, I just, uh, I grew up fishing with my dad as a kid, and um, he was a a bait fisherman. He didn't fly fish. And, um, you know, I always loved the outdoors and bugs and frogs and fish and Mm -hmm. stuff. And I just decided when I was, I don't know, 10, 11, 12 years old, somewhere in there, that fly fishing looked kind of interesting. I saw it on TV on the American Sportsman, and I read about it in Field and Stream magazine, and I thought it would. It, I thought it looked interesting, so I, you know, gradually taught myself how to do it. So you didn't take any lessons. You basically taught yourself. There were no lessons um, back in the dark ages when I started. <laughs> uh, there, there were no fishing schools. There were no lessons. I mean, if you're lucky enough to know somebody, they might and might not show you how to do it. It was yeah. kind of a black art, but you know, I, I I learned a little bit with books. I had a friend in Boy Scouts who was also interested, and we kind of learned together. And then we met this guy who owned a little tiny fly shop in Rochester, where I grew up, and he helped us out a lot. So yeah, it was you know just gradual. I learned. It took me about five years to learn what somebody could learn in a day in a fishing school today. <laughs> Well, I've actually done both, but it it is coming to me little by little. But there was something else that I did not know about you that I and I want to ask you this because I had no idea you do this. Is that you invented the magnetic net retractor? Yeah, I didn't know that. Is that the is that the one that mostly every like fly fisherman wears on no, the back of their vest? Not really. Oh. No, some people use, some people don't. It's not a not a big deal. But that's the thing that sticks to the back of your, like your fishing vest, and then there's yeah. Some, some people use it. Some people use it on a lanyard. Some people just leave it loose in the stuff in the back of their vest, and some people use the magnetic device. Yeah, well, that's what I use. So you design that. Yeah. That's something you left out. <laughs> but anyway, well, over the years, about how many people would you say you've taught to fly fish? Thousands. If you include the podcasts and the videos, yeah, many thousands. But um, you know, personally, I used to work in the, I used to teach in the fishing schools, so there's probably thousands there too. When I taught in our fishing schools here in Manchester, so yeah, it's it's many thousands somewhere, somewhere in there. Okay, so in the email that I sent to you, I mentioned that one of the things that I wanted to talk to you about, um, travel experience that you've taken, you that's worth definitely worth mentioning. What You mentioned about a trip to the Bahamas. Mm-hmm. What about that trip? I mean, what about that trip was pivotal? I was down in another island, Andros. We... Uh, we're working on the second season of the TV show, and one of the one of the shows is on bonefish. And um, we had filmed in Belize last winter, or, or no, this spring, last spring, and we didn't get quite enough footage. So we went to the Bahamas to uh, finish up the show to get the the teaching segments that we need to get. So I was there for a week, and I have some friends on Grand Bahama who uh, run a, a fly fishing operation there, guide service. And they said, hey, Tom, 
the hurricane didn't really didn't really hurt free the Freeport area as much as the rest of the island and we're we're back in business and we're guiding and the fishing is fantastic but nobody's coming cuz mm-hmm. everybody everybody was worried about the Bahamas so I said well I'm going I'm going to be in Andros I'll I'll buzz over for a couple of days and um, do an article and hopefully you know help help your business help the help the guides uh, get mm-hmm. some work so they can get back on their feet and I of course I love I love Grand Bahama I've been going there for years and I wanted to see how the hurricane had affected it what was your impression of it after that well the airport it flew into Freeport Airport and of course it had been almost completely flooded uh, during the hurricane but they were up and running and half the airport was you know okay and there was a lot of construction going on and planes were flying not from the states but just from from nasa and i guess uh, the day i was there they started international flights from the states from fort lauderdale so the airport was up and running and as i drive through uh, drove through town itself uh, through freeport i didn't see much damage at all and then when we got when we got to some of the outlying areas that were closer to the water, uh, there's a fair amount of fair amount of damage. You know, a house here would be kind of torn down mm-hmm. and in the process of rebuilding, and then another house would be just fine. So, you know, it was it, it didn't look horrible. It didn't look like a, a major disaster hit. But the eastern end of the island, there's a small settlement called McLean Town which was completely destroyed uh and i I didn't get out there i I didn't get out there at all but um you know people people lost their lives there most people lost their homes there was a a horrible incident where a father was trying to get his kids rescued and they all drowned um father and his, his two kids so two young kids and so apparently it's it's pretty it's still a mess out there and there were a couple of fishing lodges that were destroyed so uh, you know the hurricane hung over the eastern end of grand bahama and didn't damage the west end as much and what, what people don't realize i guess is that the hurricane only hit abaco and i don't know much about abaco other than some of the places on abaco were spared but the damage was much worse on Abaco because um, it kind of hit Marsh Harbor, the main town, directly. And um, there were apparently a lot of uh, Haitian uh, immigrants there, and it, apparently that Abaco was just a mess. But, you know, it didn't it didn't hit any of the other Bahamas Islands at all. Mm. And people, you know, people were shying away from going to the Bahamas and their number one industry is tourism and the last thing they need is for people to be afraid to go there um because they need they need the money they need the tourist dollars to rebuild in those portions of the the islands that were that were hit so I felt a, a little guilty going fishing in an area that was was hit by the hurricane and in one respect yes. kind of taking advantage of it but and the fishing was just absolutely spectacular because <laughs> nobody nobody had been bothering the fish for a long time. Um, but at the same time, that's that's what they need. They need people to go and visit there and spend their tourist dollars and hire, and hire the guides and stay in hotels and go to restaurants. You know, it wasn't entirely selfish. This particular experience translate into a life changing experience for you. I mean, you've you've fished all over the world. I was looking mm-hmm. at. Um, you know, at some of the different places you've been to, what what was it about that trip that was so life changing for you or pivotal? The one life changing thing that it did, I guess, is that my buddies there and Grand Bahama have been, have been, you know, they were they were pretty much spared and they wanted to to help the island rebuild, <clears throat> and uh, there was a lot of money coming into. There's a lot of food coming in and generators and a lot of help from people in the state. One of the things it did was make me proud to be an American, which is 
when you travel these days is is a little difficult to yes to do. Mm. That's <laughs> but, <laughs> but you know, um, as soon as the hurricane hit, um, there were a number of NGOs from the states who came right over and helped rebuild, and they said that there were private boats from Florida just flooding the harbor, bringing food and generators and things, just people getting in their boat and grabbing some construction materials or generators and buzzing over to the Bahamas and donating this stuff. And, our, you know, our Navy and our Coast Guard were <laughs> very helpful. So it did, it, did make me, it did make me proud to be an American. That and we then, were, uh, in, the, in the sense that we were working to make the situation better, to improve. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. And not just not just NGOs, but you know, private individuals. The other thing was, you know, as I said, a lot of money, a lot of food came in, generators, and uh, the Humane Society of all things. Mm. <laughs> you know, got all kinds of support. Right. Um, but but one of the things that um, my buddies were concerned about was there was an old folks home, retirement, not a retirement home, but like I don't know, some sort of old folks home that was damaged pretty severely and so they decided to give some of their income to um, helping rebuild this old folks home which you know most of the NGOs are going to kind of ignore because they were mm -hmm. trying to get people houses back so this Christmas my wife and son and I decided that we were not going to give each other presents we were going to take the money we spent on presents and we were going to donate it to um charities yes and i decided that i was going to send my money to the old folks home on grand bahama so that was kind of, it was kind of life-changing yeah it definitely is overall what do you think that we can all learn from your experience well i guess we can learn that you can never, you can never prepare properly for this kind of disaster. It's an act of God, an act of nature, whatever you want to call it. You, you can't, you just can't prepare for the things. No country can be properly prepared for those kind of things. In a country like the Bahamas, where they don't have a lot of Resources. income and yeah. productivity, um, they get hit hard. And the other thing is, people tend to forget about it. You know, it's not in the news anymore. Right. And people tend to forget about it, and they're, it's going to take a long time to rebuild. And we need to, you know, if we care about places like that, you can't, you can't care about every natural disaster that happens in the world. You can care, but you can't donate or, or help with every single one. You have to pick your, your places that you love and concentrate on those. And certainly, uh, I'm not going to let up on doing what I can for the Bahamas and, and Orvis is also committed to uh, helping them rebuild. My next question is, what year was this? I, I don't even remember. See, you know, you were just talking um, about the way people will forget about things. And I'm wondering, you know, for the record, what year was this? It was just last September. Okay. September of 2019. All right. And I was there in December. You were there in December. Couple. Yeah, so it's it's recent. Now, when you normally when you're traveling, are you doing most of it for business, or are you doing it um, for your own leisure? Most of the the international travel that I do, or the long distance travel, is is for either. Orvis or working on the TV show because gotta be honest with you, you, you don't get rich working in, in the fly fishing business. So <laughs> I couldn't afford to go to most of these places on my own. Right. So if I'm, when I'm, when I'm taking a trip to go fishing on my own, I'm generally going, you know, to the Catskills or maybe to Montana or mm -hmm. Idaho or Wyoming, but I don't do that kind of, I don't do that kind of uh, bigger travel lends that type of travel experience, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, yep. All right, well, now my next question is, where are some of the areas that you've fished? I just want to get this on the record. Like, where are some of the other places you've been um, work or 
you know, or you were on like pleasure fly fishing trip. Where are some of the other areas that you visited um, internationally? Um, nationally? Probably the most uh, remote and exotic was Kamchatka. Where is that? The Kamchatka is in the Russian Far East. Wow. North of Sakhalin Island, north of Japan. And was uh, was that business? Uh, just just east of Siberia. Oh, was that a business trip, or was it something you, you did on your own? I was on a hosted trip. It was business. I was on a did fishing trip. Yeah, I certainly did when I when I I went to Cuba a couple times and hosted trips there, and certainly spent <clears throat> half the time um, sightseeing and and meeting people and meeting some artists and musicians and and looking at some historical sites. Not typically something I do, but I've always been fascinated by by Cuba, having grown up as a child of the Cold War. But I, I think that my best piece of advice, and I, and I see people going on trips not knowing anything about the place they're going to, not knowing about the history and the politics and the culture. My, my best advice for someone who's traveling is to do your homework. You know, read read some history of the area and read about the culture before you go there, mm -hmm. or at least on the plane on the way there, or on the boat. You know, so many people just don't, don't appreciate where they're going. They see the typical tourist site. They don't know what's underneath all that. Exactly. They go there and they have a list of all of the, um, mm -hmm. you know, places that have been visited like thousands of times. And as far as experiencing the overall culture and the... Um, other sites, what advice do you give them so they can make the most out of their adventure? Oh, that's a that's an easy one. When people go people go on a fly fishing trip if they don't if they don't fish a lot and they're just going on a trip right. and they happen to be fly fishing, they they arrive and they can't cast very well. <laughs> and particularly in saltwater areas where you have longer casts and wind and often bigger flies. Um, people that have spent their life trout fishing just fall apart. Yeah, and they're wa and they're wasting their time, and they frustrate the guide, and they frustrate themselves. Um, people need to practice fly casting like they practice everything else, whether it's tennis or golf or whatever else they do. Mm -hmm. so that's the uh, the the biggest issue I see with people traveling fly fishing is they're just plain not prepared to be able to get the fly thirty feet away from them. What is a travel adventure in your eyes? Or the mm. ultimate, the ultimate travel adventure. Something, something I've never done before, and something that that puts me outside of my comfort zone. Yeah. Is there something in in particular that um, that you're thinking of? As I mentioned that to you, is there anywhere that you'd like to go that would be out of out of your out of your comfort zone? Any, any place that you've never been? Or... Yeah, yeah, maybe uh, New Zealand is some place I've always wanted to go. Yeah, it's a long way, but the fishing is supposedly uh, amazing and uh, very difficult right. and big trout. So, uh, and the country, of course, the country is beautiful and as I, as I've seen in pictures, and the people are supposed to be wonderful. So that's something. So that uh, wouldn't necessarily put me outside of my comfort zone, I guess. But, you know, having fished all my life, there's not much in <laughs> fishing that puts me out of my comfort zone, I guess. Maybe sail fishing, you know, maybe fishing for sailfish in Central America. Um, fly fishing for sailfish would probably put me outside my comfort zone because I've never done it before and it's a great big fish and um, that might be something. Well, that's that's an interesting answer. I appreciate that. Um, I'm wondering if you would give my readers information um, about where they can tune in to your weekly podcast. Is that done weekly? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. They can find it on, on iTunes or Spotify. It's called the Orvis Fly Fishing Podcast. The other thing you're doing, you mentioned you're doing a television a television show. And it's I would on, like um, to see it's it. On, it's on YouTube. Just look for the Orvis Guide to Fly Fishing. It's also on Amazon Prime right now. The first season is on Amazon Prime. And the, and the Orvis Learning Center, if people just type Orvis Learning Center into a search um, on Google or whatever, they'll find it. 
of your Art. what is the name of the television series that you're the doing? Orvis the Orvis Guide to Fly Fishing. Um, Orvis does have a full service uh, fly fishing travel department. Yes. All they have to do is again search for go to the Orvis website and and click on trips and schools and you know there's a lots and lots of group trips and fly fishing adventures and schools that we um, we endorse and vet and investigate so mm -hmm. and we can even give people advice you know if they call we have we have people that have been on these trips and can suggest a trip if someone um, doesn't know they just they want to take a fly fishing trip but they don't know what they want to do or where yeah. they want to go um, they can they can help them match up with the right trip do you have any updates to the um Orvis Fly Fishing 101. No, they're they'll start. Generally, they start in early spring, and all of our 70 retail stores have Fly Fishing 101 courses, okay. and they're about two hours, and they're free. Oh, so okay. people just need to find the nearest store and call and sign up. They they are limited in uh, the number of people they can take, but they're free, and they're every Saturday at I think believe 10 o'clock in the morning. Yeah, thank you, Joan. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Please visit JoanMatsuiTravelWriter.com where you can subscribe to the show so you'll never miss an episode. While you're there, check out the Travel Writing Courses, Membership Support Platform, and Private Coaching Services to help you learn travel writing. If you found value in this show, we would appreciate a rating on iTunes, and don't forget to tell a friend. This show is produced and edited at Keystone College by Ryan Evans. A full transcript of this podcast will be available on our website.